Hi all, I'd like to go over the fascinating encounter in round 7 of the FIDE Grand Prix. There's an interesting question raised by it, what uh, can be used with the 1d4 player as a kind of surprise weapon? Can the Richter Verisov attack or Verisov opening be used at a very high level? This is just one game and it's an interesting encounter. Let's see what happened. Nakamura playing white against Sergei Karyakin kicked off with d4 in round 7, 9th of October 2014. We saw the move knight f6 and now a surprising move which I've used in recent blitz games, people that follow the King's Crusher channel would have seen this move, can be a very interesting surprise weapon, this knight c3. Okay, it blocks the c pawn. In that respect it's like a reverse kind of Shigorian defence, but it has very interesting transpositional abilities here. Black now played the most principled move, d5, this is the most uh, frequent move in the database, and so did white, bishop g5. So we reached this position. Uh, some, something interesting on wiki is uh, concerning this opening. So basically it was named after the German international master Kurt Richter, and later the Soviet master Gavriel uh, Verisov, that's close to my name by the way, Gavriel but this is G-A-V-R-I-I-L, Verisov. Uh, so Richter was also part of the Richter Rosa attack against the Sicilian, so he's been getting his name around as a dangerous player. Um, so the opening uh, named after those two uh, who played it frequently for over a quarter of a century, alongside the Trompovsky attack, the Cole system, the London system, and the Torre attack, the Richter Verisov attack is one of the more common branches of the Queen's Pawn game. The more popular Roy Lopez opening looks like a Richter Verisov attack mirrored on the Queen's side. But the dynamics of play are quite different. Yes, that arm wrestling that you get in the Roy Lopez uh, concerns trying to put pressure on e5. Here it's like d5 with arm wrestling with d5. But the dynamics are very, very different here. Okay, so this move, bishop g5, looks like a kind of royal pass on, on the other side against d5 pressure. Now, black played actually in this position. Again, you know, knight bd7 is the most common move. And usually players with white play knight f3 here. As an example, on knight f3, uh, common continuation might be g6, e3, bishop g7, bishop d3. Black could castle. This kind of continuation is very interesting. A lot of games have followed this. So you can get an interesting uh, game out of it and less theoretically trodden. Okay, but in this game, actually, we see the second most popular move, Queen d3. It is a popular move, Queen d3. It supports the idea potentially of castling queenside. Black now. Uh, usually in this position actually plays c6. Against c6 I think casting queenside uh, is is fairly plausible. It's not been used that much though. Players with white tend to play knight f3 here or e4. Castling queenside in general needs to be treated with some caution. There's a greater scope of weaknesses when you castle on the queenside. So anyway here actually after queen d3 Sergei Karyakin played actually an immediate c5. Players with white in this position usually snap off on f6 because c5 doesn't actually support the d5 pawn. So a kind of weakness in the last move, you could say, just take a hair and then take here to put frontal pressure quickly on d5, making use of castling to exert pressure quickly on d5. And the game could continue like this, e4 here. But um, black isn't doing so badly. Black, according to engine view, is, is virtually equal here, actually. On check, instead of uh, playing bishop d7, which runs into casting queenside, black could actually um, play here king e7 or king f8. And Stockfish gives this as about equal. Uh, black's got um, the two bishops although the king's been compromised a little bit. It's an interesting game. 
So anyway, after c5, yeah, bishop takes f6 seems to be the most common, uh, according to Leipzig, for what players will white play here with 11 games, knight f3, four games. This casting queenside, uh, four games as well. Was it e4 was an option? So a casting queenside was played by Nakamura. And actually, Sergei played a very interesting move, which kind of breaks a beginner's rule, which we start in our evolution of chess understanding. We we tend to realize that um, a move like c4 uh, releases the tension. It releases the tension somewhat to play a move like c4. But um, there might be a justification in this particular position because the king's here. Usually when you reduce the tension in the center, white has a free hand, either on the king side or in the center. But because of the king being here, this is more justified to play the forcing move c4. And actually it's Stockfish's first choice move to play c4. I think the, the real power of this move is in the follow-up. Now perhaps white should play queen f3 here, just to try and exert influence on d5. That might be quite interesting, just playing queen f3. Uh, if we see queen f3, uh, so we're putting immediate pressure here, and if, say, e6, then e4, we can we can keep this theme, like a royal Lopez theme, uh, on, on d5 instead of e5, to keep pressure on d5. And this will be quite interesting. Um, but because the king's here already committed, black might consider a more aggressive uh, response here, like queen a5. So it, it is a little bit tricky here, this position, because uh, any e4, uh, well, actually, the queen's also on the bishop here, so knight takes e4, it's possible. All right, so it's just something to bear in mind in this position. Although this does seem a very interesting concept because of the follow-up. White actually played to g3, and there's an idea or immediately of knight b5 for knight c7. So that's one tactical implication of playing queen to g3. Uh, so yeah, that would be like splat. If, if a routine move, knight b5, ouch. <laughs> that would be a monumental blunder here. It's really quite embarrassing. What does black actually do? <laughs> if a6, for example, check, yeah, total disaster. Queen a3 check here, winning uh, the game instantly. <laughs> so yeah, something to bear in mind. So Carrier can actually covers that possibility of knight b5 quite elegantly and creates some threats of his own. This move queen a5 exposes an idea b5, b4, not only covering b5, but the a2 pawn. And then white's king will be under a quick attack. So a very powerful move, and already at move six, unfortunately for Nakamura, black seems to have more than equalized, and this is this is very rare that it occurs in Grandmaster games so early for black to have more than equalized and having almost a, a small advantage here. Um, a routine move like knight f3, just I think it simply runs into b5, b4. If we look at knight f3, let's have a quick look, b5. And then just b4, and it's already very, very nasty. What is white doing here? He's getting smashed in this position. Uh, he's getting absolutely smashed. Is the knight going to retreat? Knight e4, ouch. White's going to end up getting mated here. You know, queen takes a2 is actually a mate in five. That's how disastrous it could be from this position if white isn't careful. So there's an absolute false mate with c3 coming along. Uh, that would that would be absolutely a total disaster this position so already it's a bit precarious for the u s number one player rank nine in the world this position is already not too hot as a start position uh, Nakamura tries e four but uh black now plays another very powerful follow up move and only only one move will do here otherwise white is getting some good chances to get a big advantage, maybe even more than just a slight advantage, a big advantage if black doesn't play the exact right move needed here. If uh, black, say, took, say we take on e4, that's that's not good at all. Bishop takes e4. Beautiful game for white. 
so white's even got knight b5 again as well no uh, but if e6 then again e takes d5 say something like this this is a disaster for black check here what, what is going on here we can it's it's horrible say so, say so like this total disaster no black can't afford to actually play e6 here uh, that sort of routine move is just bad uh, you know e takes d5 the best is knight takes but here again white's getting a fantastic game so like this king b1 and it's going to be following up with knight e2 with possibilities kicking the queen and then d5 later no black actually plays it very aggressively here with b5 just ignoring the d5 pawn because this b4 the power of b4 and the queen just coming hitting a2 so here Nakamura played king b1 cautious looking move uh, let's see if he took on d5 then b4 is just really strong uh, the best the engines come out of sacrificing the knight that's it's not very nice this again is a just a total disaster scenario so okay this move b5 not caring about d5 the best move king b1 and now it's this position again e6 is not chosen that will give white i think a good game with e takes d5 and even b4 here can just be ignored actually d takes e6 and ignored again rookie one this is good for for white very dangerous it could really backfire back badly on black by this position lots and lots of attacking prospects here for white so if we go back uh, actually after king b1 Kanyakin played d takes e4 and he still got his small advantage from the opening and in fact this b5 means that the light squares are a good diagonal the game continued now with bishop takes f6 so an interesting forcing move why was this played you might think well let's have a look g takes was the response if knight takes then uh, this this is an interesting position it might actually be playable but queen e5 is interesting pinning against a5 black would have to play very precisely here the engine indicates knight here if here rook b8 this is a tricky position but i think white's got some opportunities here okay so the way uh Sergei played it he's covering that e5 square against queen e5 by not playing here he's make he's making cover and if he took with the e pawn it would seem to cover e5 as well but this position knight takes e4 and this this is quite pleasant actually for discovery attacks with queen e3 and if black say played bishop e7 then queen takes g7 so this this looks as though it might be some trouble for black here after knight c3 white has opportunities like simply the check in the center looks as though black's development is behind so sergey played the best move one of the best moves it seems by playing g takes this is the absolute best move again uh to maintain a small nagging advantage with the black pieces we have knight takes e4 uh, now bishop b7 and this is tricky i mean what does white do here the queen's actually eyeing e1 we can't defend the knight if we play f3 that looks a little bit uh bad passive let me just rook c8 and then we've got b4 coming up with a strong attack still so here we see uh, an aggressive looking gambit um, not not gambit an aggressive looking move not minding potentially weak pawn to open up this d file at least so black is really i think compelled with his bishop attacks now uh to really take on c5 i don't think anything else would do here a, a move like bishop c6 i think white can play bishop e2 to f3 that's pretty good so it was taken d takes and in this position okay it seems awkward for black to castle any side of the board here uh, and also if e6 this wasn't played 
this position I think might be quite okay for white knight h3 and it's uh, potentially quite dangerous if, if ever taking here queen g7 this this should be quite pleasant enough for white this this kind of position where there's some ideas with knight takes e6 getting on the d7 square even so okay um black played rook c8 which i think again is one of the strongest moves in the position e6 i think was playable as well then i have we have bishop e2 to try and develop pieces you might think well why not actually just uh, knight f3 i think um this position is keeping this bishop blocked i think that's the problem it's a problem piece this bishop how do we actually develop this 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 is a good shield for bishop getting to a decent square I could probably play this and this this seems very nice for black this this position here with this bishop passive so white tries to just swap off that bishop which is much better at the moment for this one on f1 by playing this move bishop e2 we have queen c7 Nakamura doesn't want the exchange of queens queen h3 now if queen takes c5 that would be a blunder because of queen d7 checkmate we have though uh, the queen has just come off this g file so black is now free to play bishop g7 and try and castle now finally uh, if he had tried something like f4 just to try and keep preventing bishop g7 i don't think this is a problem queen takes c5 and then maybe bishop e4 later possibly with the bishop coming here then bishop g7 possibly that kind of scenario is possible say knight f3 or even c3 is dangerous just with the idea of queen b4 here so white's even got to be careful about this third rank for c3 so okay f4 doesn't it doesn't look like a great move so the queen just went to h3 at least it's tying down the queen at the moment bishop g7 and then we have bishop f3 bishop takes f3 knight takes f3 Black could have castled here. I don't think there's a major penalty for castling. He chose e6 for the moment. Uh, and now rook h e1. And now black castled. But it looks as though there's a classic kind of rook maneuver to try and get an attack going here against the bishop. This kind of attacking construction. Crude but maybe very, very dangerous. Um, you'll notice actually one virtue of e6 is that the rook d7s if they were useful that they've been ruled out uh, so we see this rook d4 trying to swing across for an attack queen takes c5 not minding rook g4 and here our black has got latent attacking potential stored up actually not only with moves like c3 but also potentially on this diagonal if this bishop gets active on this diagonal then queen b4 is always going to be dangerous note also the rooks haven't done anything for the first rank here so there's back row vulnerability issues potentially now queen h6 is a serious threat here in this position uh, so black is about to be wiped out if, if he doesn't play an accurate move a move like c3 end of game queen h6 black has to give up the queen so that has to be addressed and a move like king h8 probably doesn't cut it either very well although actually 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 there's no clear reputation the engine still likes black if king h8 I don't think there's an exchange stack or anything this this seems actually okay there's nothing really going on there either but uh black played rook fd8 so that i think there's a number of good moves even f5 might actually be a good move here immediately and then king h8 this kind of move just opening up the bishop leave it looks as though black's just simply better white's king it's just a major liability in these variations um so anyway rook fd8 was played which means queen f8 is able to answer this and also this rook centralizing could be a menace a mechanism has actually been set up with rook fd8 uh, involving uh potentially a queen coming here at some point uh to provoke uh a move like c3 and then we've got a move like this and we've got coordination here so there's two coordination points coming up in this game 
the bishop can coordinate the queen on b2 the rook can coordinate with the queen like this because white's back row is slightly vulnerable so all in all black has strong attacking prospects unfortunately for nakamura in this position the opening has drastically backfired at this point on move uh, 20 black has a clear advantage white has a consolation here he can pick up a pawn in this position at the moment so he can restore pawn equality with a forcing sequence but it actually in effect opens up this diagonal we're about to see this now white has nothing better it seems than to pick up a pawn with queen h6 so using the pin queen f8 and now picks up the pawn the problem is it's opening up an attacking diagonal on b2 and the back row is slightly weak because the rooks they just look as though they're geared up for the attack but um, in the art of war it indicates you should be putting yourself beyond defeat before going on to the attack here white is not beyond defeat that back row is vulnerable this diagonal is vulnerable queen b4 is an important forcing move queen a4 after that is an important forcing move there are lots of important forcing moves based on coordination of the black pieces here this is a very very bad position for white so here king h8 ejects the black queen by unpinning queen f4 already okay moves like queen b4 are dangerous but it might not work here uh, let's have a look in this position if queen b4 this wasn't played rook d5 was played but if queen b4 it looks natural to try and do that it's hitting uh, the rook here so there's interesting variations going on here that if rook takes g7 black has a very interesting resource actually in this position can you spot it if i give you five seconds starting from now it shows you know white is not beyond the feet here this back row is vulnerable queen takes e1 then we have rook d1 then we can take the queen and we just exchange up it shows white is not beyond the feet it all started really from the opening unfortunately so um yeah even queen b4 is dangerous here um, c3 technically the engines thinking c3 is the most dangerous certain analysis but rook d5 is also another fantastic move <clears throat> it introduces not just possibilities of c3 but also putting black beyond defeat because the rook have five ideas to protect against knight g5 which might be a danger for the f7 pawn or the h7 pawn it seems with this rook d5 black is not minding so much the f7 sorry not minding so much the h7 being a source of attack here he just is more concerned about f7 so he wants to accelerate his attack it's a very interesting uh, conception so white carries on going for the attack but with vulnerability knight g5 so hitting f7 so queen takes f7 could be a good move for white uh, but rook f5 defends against that we have queen e3 and it looks as though white now still holding the knight is threatening rook h4 it's pretty crude looking but black has more attacking potential here it seems again a rook goes looking at eyeing up the first row here white has nothing better than to carry on this attacking directly on h7 now white plays rook h4 you might think surely is, is, is there nothing better can white actually get the rook back how can the rook get back here black controls d4 white's pretty committed if he tries something like this it's it's no good c3 the attack's just gonna uh, run right here this is, this is just a disaster queen a3 it's a total disaster so I move like this queen b2 checkmate so white has to carry on with this rook h4 it was plausible for black to just play h6 but sergey plays actually cheeky king g8 very cheeky okay so what's going on here if knight takes h7 then queen b4 
double attack and if c3 queen a4 embarrassing back row issue and if here then b4 and the attack really is is getting horrible uh you might think if takes then king takes h7 carnivorous king and if c takes queen takes b4 again we get multiple threats and this is getting unbearable for the back row issues uh, it's just impossible to defend this if queen e2 rook d2 it's impossible to defend this coordination so okay so um so here after king g8 actually uh instead of taking that h7 pawn uh, so this would be just accelerating black's attack really um why actually played rook g4 by the way just to rule out rook takes h7 i think that's uh very bad here because of rook e5 uh rook e5 horrible uh what does what I actually do here say this position rook takes g5 and then the carnivorous king is actually protecting against rook g7 check as well so the king can actually take the rook so yeah it's not good either way to take on h7 so the rook just comes here and it looks as though this this pin could be useful potentially but now in a very aggressive move from black h5 if the rook now goes to g3 to try and maintain the potential pin that's an important question here, but again, rook e5 is strong. The queen drops back. In this position, black has a crushing uh, forcing sequence available based on the, the weak back row and b2. As the art of war, as I mentioned, you shouldn't really go on to the attack without being beyond defeat yourself. And here, it's illustrated graphically. Rook takes e1, queen takes e1. Can you see what black could play here, which is absolutely crushing? If I give you five seconds to pause the video. Okay, queen b4, back row tactic, hitting b2. So if takes, there's rook takes, rook d1. Checkmate. If queen c1, let's play rook d1, for example, just to mate on b2 here. We're just winning the queen, keeping that queen skewer. So yeah, it's not possible to keep the pin with rook g3 without dire consequences. So rook e4 was played. But now still queen b4 is strong and is played queen b4. And white is forced virtually to play c3. Anything else is just not working. Uh, queen c1. Rook takes g5, the queen's overloaded, can't defend here like this. If here queen, sorry, if here is on a shield, like queen c5, protecting g5. <clears throat> uh, so yes, um, so rook e4, queen b4, c3. If b3, that's another question, it's uh, not good. The bishop's really running right here. Rook f d5 is apparently one of the strongest now. With a threat of queen takes e1. Taking here and then rook d1 mating. That's the threat here because otherwise there might be some sort of defense. It's just horrible for white. This position is just, it's just diabolical. Queen a3 now threatened with again back row issues of taking on c3. So it's a horrible position. Okay, so uh, yeah, the move c3 was played miserable. Transitions into a worse ending scenario. A lot of things get exchanged off now after bishop takes c3. So hitting the rook, hitting b2. White has to go into this miserable ending, which is probably lost after taking rook takes g5. Uh, not all rook and pawn endings are drawn. This one, I think, is one of them. Uh, black as well as being a pawn up here which you not, might not think is a major triumph just being a pawn up in this position but black controls that d-file at the moment the rook's very active black's got all the play c3 looks weak fragmented pawns so g3 king comes up comes up 
King C2. Rook D3 now. So putting a lot of pressure potentially with Rook F3 on F2. Before that happens, F4 is played, maybe addressing Rook F3. Well, I could end up really passive if he doesn't do anything about that. I think H4 here as an alternative. This position, G3 is going to drop if F4 here. Let's take on G3. So White has to be very, very careful against Rook F3. You know, doubling the rooks is just going to be painful. So F4 now, whilst G3 is still protected with this one. But Black now dominates that D4 and threatens Rook D2 check to win H2. That's protected. King comes up. And it's a miserable position. If Black's left to his own devices, the move H4 here will fracture white structure here in a bad way. Also, the king can walk potentially to G4 on the light squares and then H4. Either plan is very effective, I think. So, let's say A3 for the sake of argument, H4 fragmenting the pawns. Rook F3. With this one next on c3 actually as well it's not just about these guys um, it's just horrible because white's rooks are just not doing anything anytime rook d4 then black cashes out on the king side just using the fragmentation issues um, I think rook takes f4 is good but also even rook takes a3 with loads of pass pawns here so yes if white doesn't do anything h4 or king f5 it's horrible so white tries um, a4 to try and undermine this pawn chain. It's just supported though. Rook f2. Now king f5. The king is making progress. Um, I think the little h4 was also plausible as well. Check here. Yes, it's not great. That's taken. Uh, king g6. It's pointless, I think, to play rook f6 here. Uh, just king g7. The problem is e5 is is just weak, it's just wasting time. This position e5 is dropping. So I didn't bother with that check. He played a5 but now e5 is victimized. And again, check. Okay, hoping for rook takes f7 and move to get around here. So if king takes, this wasn't played, if king takes, it's still better for black though, but uh there might be some issues to address. There's always rook d6. It's better for black. But uh, king g6 was played. A bit of torture. Rook d3. Toying a bit with white here. But now rook f3 actually has a concrete rook f2 threat. Rook d4, yeah. Check. White can't afford to go into the king and pawn ending with rook d2. So he's losing h2. But he's going for his A pawn, that's the last chance saloon, to take on A6 and go for the A pawn. Black in the meantime has got pass pawn potential here and here, two against one, and knocking this out for this one, basically. Pass pawn potential here against the pass pawn here. And we see this slot races type ending. Uh, slot races is one of my favourite games I play with brother or not a lot on the Atari 100. The rooks are a bit like the slot races used to go horizontally and vertically. So rook g2, white takes there. Rook takes g3. Okay, so b4 creating a pass pawn here, but uh, in a masterful manner. While the rooks on the third rank, there's rook b3 check as a concrete resource to make sure white's only got the a pawn coming up. And if white ignores this, if white doesn't take, say this then uh, check here. It's horrible. This is absolutely winning just to play h4 here apparently. So say takes h3. Say here we can just take an h2. Yeah so there's a fast running h pawn in the background here if needed. Very fast running h pawn. So this this was taken. I think h4 is actually close to winning as well in this position but uh, rook b3 check just to wipe out White's pass pawn potential. Uh, rook b5. So looking at e5. Uh, also, more importantly, though, as well, this one, get the rook behind the pawn. So the rook's behind the pawn. Here, I think it's pointless to play this. In fact, c3. 
if king b4 is playing c3 because if it takes it we've just got c2 queening so that's how bad the position is it's just horrible two horrible pass pawns coming straight out white so c3 c2 and actually the two pass pawns look after each other uh, now we see this once they both come there to the second rank soon then the rook can't ever take either of them without the other one queening. The king looks as though it's going to win the rook, but now in this position anything really wins for black. I think even king f5 might be winning immediately. Nope, I'm mistaken. Pardon me. Apparently not anything wins here. I thought this was very very good. Quite a lot of uh, moves are like plus eight here or more. Uh, rook h8 was played, but there's also rook any rook rook d8, rook g8, rook f8, rook e8. All of these any rook move along the first rank basically. But if the king moved, there's a little trick. There's a last little trick here with rook takes c2. So white with this trick, if it takes, then that's ridiculous. That white queens and stops the queen. Apparently this is equal still this position theoretically, but. Uh, Okay, little trick there. And if if queening here, rook takes c8, and apparently this this is equal apparently. Okay, but uh, no, black doesn't have to do that. Um, we see the move rook h8 here. The rook itself is actually a tactical vulnerability to rook takes c2. It's just taken out of the equation there for black to be able to queen without losing the rook on c8 to rook takes c2 is the deflection. So very clever, very precise. Rook h8, keeping the massive advantage against that rook takes c2 tactic. Now it's really getting spelled out, it's lost. Rook h1, is there still a tactical trick in this position? Well, king f5 is played. And white uh, resigned here. I think this is slightly different from the other deflection. Let's have a look. If rook takes h2, now queening here is similar to the other deflection. That this position apparently is equal. This is all equal. But just rook takes h2 leaves black a rook up. Just let white queen for black to queen a rook up. Now, there's no major check the queen here so it's just a rook up for black so that's not really working that well rook takes h2 and if king b7 just the queen like this in this position um, king takes e5 it's possible and now the pawns do look after each other uh, so for example if queening take here and the rook can never take the pawn because of that queening or that or vice versa. So the king can actually just go here and this is just bad. Space invader's gone wrong. E five and E four. So E three E two <laughs> Space Invaders are landing. King D three. And we're gonna get King D two in. Yes, so the, the rook is just overwhelmed. <clears throat> so yeah, it's um yeah, so King F five, end of game. Fantastic you played by Sergei Karyakin. He played actually a really unbelievably uh, appropriate counter mechanism to Queen D three in this position. Unbelievable. Because actually in live book, believe it or not, C five is not the most common move. That's twenty seven games for C five. And it seems to have such a fantastic plan behind it. Usually, players with black just play c6. Yeah, 99 games with c6, 90 with h6, 48 with e6. It's unbelievable that basically Sergei Karyakin has played this move with an unbelievably powerful, aggressive plan. Maybe it's a question of giving away your, where the king is too quickly for this plan to be. Power of just going for it. Hmm, it's fascinating. It needs to be uh, studied from a theoretical 
perspective of this game. Perhaps perhaps this was a mistake, just casting was theoretically a mistake because of c4. We have this idea in some variations of the French defence where Black plays c4 and gets a strong attack. So yeah, an amazing game. Um, and uh, yeah, it's interesting for uh, Ikaro to try these interesting openings up. It makes for a very interesting chess, uh, win or lose. Comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.